news tonight. Soaring tensions. The U.S. bars China's goods in the latest stand against the nation. Human infrastructure. The Biden administration lends a helping hand to the hardest workers. Crisis continues. Myanmar falls deeper into chaos as patients of the virus gasps for air. Basile Beauty. France celebrates a day of unity with a glimmering Eiffel Tower as the centerpiece. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the latest trade war between the U.S. and China. The U.S. ban on all products from China's Xinjiang nears the Senate passes a forced labor bill. The bill would create a rebutable presumption, assuming that all products in Xinjiang are made with forced labor and thus banned under the 1930 Tariff Act, unless importers can prove otherwise. The U.S. Senate passed a bill on Wednesday banning products from China's Xinjiang region. It's the latest effort by Washington to punish Beijing for what U.S. officials say is an ongoing genocide there against Uyghurs and other Muslim groups. China denies mistreating Uyghurs and says the camps are vocational training centers needed to fight extremism. Under the current rule, the import of goods into the U.S. can be banned if there is reasonable evidence of forced labor. The bill assumes goods manufactured in Xinjiang are made with forced labor until proven otherwise and certified by U.S. authorities. The Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act was passed in the Senate by unanimous bipartisan consent. It was now passed the House of Representatives before being sent to the White House for President Joe Biden to sign into law. It was not immediately clear when that might take place. Republican Senator Marco Rubio, who co-authored the bill, called on the House to act quickly. In a statement, he wrote, we will not turn a blind eye to the CCP's ongoing crimes against humanity, and we will not allow corporations a free pass to profit from those horrific abuses. The bill's other co-author, Democrat Jeff Merkley, also said, no American consumers should be inadvertently purchasing products from slave labor. Democratic and Republican aides expect the measure would get strong support from the House after it approved a similar measure nearly unanimously last year. Rights groups and Western officials have long maintained that Xinjiang authorities have facilitated forced labor by detaining around a million Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities since 2016. Senate Democrats agree to a $3.5 trillion budget for a reconciliation bill that would fund what President Biden has called human infrastructure, including health care and home care workers. Uh, we have come, the Budget Committee has come to an agreement. Senate Democrats unveiled a $3.5 trillion investment plan that would come on top of an existing $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill. Democratic Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer excitedly announced the measure late Tuesday. Every major program that President Biden has asked us for is funded in a robust way. The Democratic spending bill would fund what President Joe Biden has called the human infrastructure that I talk about. Human infrastructure, including health care and home care workers, and might not need a single Republican vote. Schumer said the agreement, which still must be endorsed by the 50-member Senate Democratic Caucus, would include a significant expansion of the Medicare health care program for the elderly, a top goal of Budget Committee Chairman Bernie Sanders. The wealthy and large corporations are going to start paying their fair share of taxes so that we can protect the working families of this country. Sanders suggested the plan could include tax hikes on wealthy individuals and large corporations and would include provisions to combat climate change. If we do not get our act together in transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel, that the planet we're going to be leaving our children and our grandchildren will be increasingly unhealthy and uninhabitable. Further details were expected on Wednesday when Biden will meet with Senate Democrats to discuss the plan. The Senate's 50 Republicans are not expected to back the broader infrastructure effort. That forces Democrats to pursue the plan through what's known as budget reconciliation, a procedure that permits some bills to become law with a simple majority vote. Growing military tensions around Taiwan as well as economic and technological rivalry between China and the United States raised the prospect of a crisis in the region as the power balance shifts in China's favor. 
China fired back at Japan on Tuesday, saying Tokyo was irresponsible for naming Beijing as its top national security concern in its annual defense white paper. China in recent months has increased its military activity around Taiwan, a democratically ruled territory it considers its own, which is not far from Japan's Okinawa Islands. In Japan's defense papers, approved by Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga's government on Tuesday, Tokyo said China was inciting a military crisis in the region. China's foreign ministry spokesman Zhao Lixian rejected Japan's conclusions about what it calls a normal military buildup. Chinese President Xi Jinping earlier this month pledged to complete reunification and squash independence movements in Taiwan. Meanwhile, Japan has said they would join forces with the United States to defend Taiwan from any invasion, according to local media. In response to Tuesday's white paper, Taiwan's foreign ministry expressed thanks to Japan for its support. The United Arab Emirates opened its new embassy in Israel as its envoy hailed the trade and investment opportunities that closer ties would bring at the flag-raising ceremony, also attended by the Israel's president. To give us an update on this, we have other than world news pressure correspondent Christina Almeida joining us from Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Christina? Yes, Shanali. The UAE has now become the first Gulf state to have an embassy in Israel after the flurry of positive diplomatic breakthroughs between Israel and some predominantly Muslim countries that was brokered by the Trump administration. The opening of the UAE embassy, which is situated in Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, followed the inauguration of Israel's embassy in the UAE last month. Israel's president, Isaac Herzog, attended the opening ceremony in Tel Aviv with the UAE ambassador, Mohammed al Qaja. Israeli's president called the opening of the embassy an important milestone in our journey towards the future, peace, prosperity and security for the Middle East. Bahrain, Sudan and Morocco have also improved their ties with Israel, but to the anger of Palestinian officials. The UAE says, though, that improved ties with Israel should ultimately benefit Palestinian issues. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adil Derino World News Special Correspondent Christina Almeida reporting from Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Scattered protests broke out in Haiti's capital. Gasoline shortages added to concerns over insecurity and police announced a new arrest a week after the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse pitched the already troubled Caribbean nation into political crisis. In Haiti's capital, mourners laid flowers at a tribute to President Jovenel Moïse on Wednesday, marking one week since his assassination. On the same day, scattered protests broke out as fuel shortages added to concerns over insecurity. Moise was shot dead at his home by what Haitian authorities describe as a unit of assassins, including two Haitian Americans and 26 Colombians, five of which are still on the run. A third Haitian American, Christian Emmanuel Sanon, was arrested on Sunday by Haitian authorities. They have accused him of being a mastermind of the attack. Another name that has come to light is Worldwide Capital Lending Group, who Haitian police say is responsible for fundraising the crime. The company, which is based in Florida, did not reply to a request for comment. Police also named former Haitian Senator John Joel Joseph as a key player in the plot. They say he supplied weapons and planned meetings. Authorities are searching for him. Moise's killing has plunged poverty-stricken Haiti into chaos. The fuel shortage has paralysed Haiti's biggest city, Port-au-Prince. Residents blamed the fuel shortage on gangs and opportunistic black market sellers. Also on Wednesday, Haiti's UN ambassador, Antonio Rodriguez, appealed for support. Washington has sent a team of experts to investigate Moise's murder with a focus on any connection to the U.S. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back. A mass screening carried out at a Malaysian vaccine centre showed that over 200 staff tested positive for the virus. To give us an update on this, we have other there in a world news special correspondent Avantika Gunasekaran joining us now from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Avantika. Yes, Shanali. 
A COVID-19 vaccine center in Malaysia has laid down its needles after almost half the staff tested positive for coronavirus. Out of 454 workers and volunteers screened, 204 have been infected. The facility, which gives 3,000 doses a day, is located around 15 miles outside Kuala Lumpur and has been closed for cleaning and a change in staffing. People who receive their vaccines during this week at the centre are now being advised to self-isolate for 10 days. Malaysia has announced new measures to support its ailing public health system as a wave of cases, fueled by the highly infectious Delta variant, sweeps across the country. Malaysia has one of the highest per capita rates of infection in Southeast Asia, but also one of the highest rates of inoculation. About 25% of the population have, have received at least one dose of a vaccine. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. That was other than a World News Pusher correspondent Avantika Gunasekaran reporting from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Myanmar is in the midst of its most serious wave of COVID-19 to date, but people are shunning the state health system, fearing substandard treatment at the hospitals abandoned by the medics in the protests of the February 1st military coup and wary of giving legitimacy to the junta by turning it for help. Queues for oxygen cylinders in Myanmar are a stark reminder of a worsening COVID-19 crisis there. Myanmar is in the midst of its most serious wave of infections to date, with efforts to manage it hampered by nationwide chaos after the military coup. The junta said it had restricted supplies to individuals to avoid hoarding, rejecting accusations of trying to monopolise them. But some residents who spoke to Reuters said they are choosing to hole up in a room in their home rather than enter a quarantine centre, a decision based on mistrust of the military healthcare system. Hospitals were under intense pressure even before the recent outbreak, with some reporting most of their medics had joined the anti-junta civil disobedience movement, striking in response to the military coup. In contrast, the ousted civilian government appeared to have had more success when the pandemic hit last year. People's willingness to submit to testing, tracking and isolation helped to lower transmission rates. A spokesman for the military authorities said they were doing all they could and appealed for cooperation. One of the responses from the military has been opening military hospitals to the public and to step up services there. On Monday, daily cases topped 5,000 for the first time, more than double the highest figure last year. More than a third of COVID-19 tests were positive. A figure doctors say points to the outbreak being far more widespread than the official testing numbers indicate. Meanwhile, the military government said on Monday that vaccinations would now be stepped up, partly with help from its biggest foreign ally, Russia. Russia is among the few countries that have openly embraced the military government, which has been condemned globally over the coup and the deadly crackdown on pro-democracy protesters. Just as Americans thought that the worst was left behind, there was a dramatic turnabout on the number of COVID cases in the United States. Infections, hospitalizations and deaths climbed again with plummeting daily number of vaccines. The summer spike is catching experts by surprise who never expected numbers like these. Tonight, new infections, hospitalizations, even deaths are increasing when many predicted they would be at all-time lows. In Missouri, more COVID patients are filling beds than during the deadly winter surge. Hospitals here pleading for more doctors. After accounting for just 0.1% of cases in April, the dangerous, highly contagious Delta variant now makes up nearly 60% of new cases. As infections double, vaccinations are plummeting, down 54% last week. Have you had yours yet? As more states go door to door offering at home vaccinations, tonight a new report says the Tennessee Department of Health will stop all adolescent vaccine outreach amid pressure from Republican lawmakers. The agency says they're reevaluating their process and wouldn't comment on former medical director Michelle Fiscus, who says she was fired after efforts to get teens vaccinated at school. With 60% of children who are eligible for vaccination still not inoculated, many fear with the return to school and after a summer together, a fall surge is imminent. We have some good news for you. 
The EU is taking its first actions against the race to save the planet as they have unveiled ambitious plans to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel cars from 2035, speeding up city drive to a zero emission electric vehicles. As part of a broad package of measures to combat global warming and climate change, the European Union on Wednesday proposed an effective ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars from 2035. The move is set to speed up the switch to zero-emission electric vehicles. The European Commission has also proposed a 55 percent cut in CO2 emissions from cars by 2030 compared to 2021 levels, much higher than the current target of 37.5 percent. It also proposed a 100 percent cut in CO2 emissions by 2035, making it virtually impossible to sell any new fossil fuel powered vehicles in the bloc. However, the ambitious plan was met with heavy criticism from the German Auto Industry Association, which labeled the measures not technology neutral. According to the head of the association, the EU's goal is not open for all technologies that bring climate neutrality and is instead focused too much on electromobility. However, he added that German car makers aim to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 at the latest, but prefers a different method to that put forward by Brussels. With a blueprint this massive, the Commission's proposals need to be negotiated and approved by EU member states as well as the European Parliament, a process that could take a couple of years. Welcome back and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. China will send 431 athletes to the Tokyo Games as part of a 777 number delegation. The team includes 298 female athletes and 133 male athletes with a range in the age of 14 years to the age of 52 years old. Heavy rain and once in a generation floods caused the collapse of numerous houses in Germany's western state, leaving several people missing and many stranded on rooftops. Britain's Duchess of Sussex has created an animated family series for streaming platform Netflix that she has also become the executive producer. Prince Harry said it's a statement that the series would be centered on an adventure of a 12-year-old girl who is inspired by a variety of influential women from history. Pope Francis returned to the Vatican 11 days after undergoing a surgery at a Rome hospital to remove part of his colon. Taking advantage of record warm temperatures and midnight sun, Finns enjoyed a midnight swim in the downtown Helsinki. According to a weather forecaster, the night was the hottest in their digitized measurement in history. A bus has exploded in a remote northern Pakistan, killing Chinese engineers working on a nearby dam project and several others were reported dead. More than a dozen people, including Chinese nationals and Pakistani soldiers, were killed in a blast targeting a bus in a remote region of northern Pakistan on Wednesday. That's according to multiple sources who said the toll could rise. It was not immediately clear whether the blast was the result of a roadside device or something planted inside the bus. Inspector General Mu'azzam Jah Ansari said the bus plunged into a ravine. Bomb disposal experts were at the scene and police were investigating what he said looked like sabotage. <laughs> Beijing condemned the blast and asked Pakistan to punish the perpetrators and protect the safety of Chinese personnel, institutions and projects. A senior administrative officer of the Hazara region said the bus was carrying more than 30 Chinese engineers to the site of the Dasu Dam in Upper Kohistan. The Dasu hydroelectric project is part of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is a $65 billion investment plan. It falls under Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative, aimed at connecting western China to the Gwadar seaport in southern Pakistan. And finally tonight, 
Fireworks lit up Paris's skyline as France celebrated its national day. The colorful show took place around the iconic Eiffel Tower landmark, which was lit up in the colors of the French national flag during the display. Early in the day, thousands of military and public security personnel paraded by foot on vehicles and aboard jets. This year marked the return of the traditional military parade after last year's celebrations were replaced by the limited access event due to the COVID-19 crisis. It was the first time since the end of the World War II that France did not hold a military parade. France's celebration of the national unity falls on the anniversary of the 1789 storming of the Bastille Fortress in Paris, the turning point in the French Revolution. Well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.